rediscovering worship. God's been, been talking to me an awful lot lately over the last uh, two or three or even more months about this thing called worship. And, and uh, you know, do you really know, Dave, what worship is? Do you really understand what worship really is? Do we understand that God himself says that there are ways to worship him that he delights on, delight, delights in, and there are other ways that God specifically says, no, don't worship that way. You know that? The Bible says, no, do not worship like those guys are worshiping. That is not pleasurable to me. That is not acceptable to me. Um, and do we understand why worship is indispensable for our own spiritual lives? Uh, um it's like breathing air, isn't it? It's, it's dispensable. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but, you know, our call to worship is still uh, really our, our highest call as Christians. And, and when we express our worship to God in a way that's pleasing to him, in a way that engages him, God promises that he will tangibly enter into our worship and meet us in that place of worship. And, and promises to even transform us in that place of worship. Incredible promise of God concerning worship. And also, I want to start by uh, looking at the Old Testament tabernacle. Um, in here, we can say that word, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's also known or became known as the tabernacle of Moses. Okay. Because the word tabernacle basically means to dwell with and live amongst. Uh, J John chapter 1 in, in, the, in the Greek says that Jesus came and tab tabernacled amongst us. So the tabernacle was the place where the Israelites came. And we need to understand these things up front. That, that the Israelites came usually one by one or in families to the tabernacle. Uh, it was not a corporate place where the whole co community came into the tabernacle to worship God. Number one, it wasn't big enough. But number two, the, the tabernacle had a specific purpose. It was about individuals coming into the presence of God and, and restoring presence with God. Uh, that's what a relationship with God. That's what really the, 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 the Mo tabernacle of Moses was all about. So in, in Exodus chapters 25 to 30, God gave Moses some really specific instructions about how the tabernacle was to be built. And you go, why? why? Like, like, were there zoning bylaws back then? You know, was, was there actually building codes back in the Old Testament that they had to be built a certain way? Uh, um, well, the answer is that, um, no, God said, I want you to build a tabernacle a certain way and set it up a certain way. And even when you come into the tabernacle to dress in a certain way, because God said the tabernacle was a shadow and a, um, what's the word he used? A copy and a shadow of what? Of the true tabernacle in heaven. Okay. The tabernacle on earth was a copy or shadow of the true tabernacle in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 and 5. The point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest, Jesus, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the, ma of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by man. And, and, and so the Israelites serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. That is why Moses was warned that when he was about to build the tabernacle, he said, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. God gave a pattern because the tabernacle on earth was to be a copy or a shadow of, of the true tabernacle in heaven. Okay. Uh, now, the word copy means an exhibit, an example, or a pattern. The, really, the word copy is not the right word because when we think of copy, we mean we think photocopy. The tab tabernacle on earth was not a photocopy or three-dimensional, uh, uh, what, what do we do now? We do three-dimensional printers, right? It was not a, an exact replication of what was in heaven. And the other word, it says it's a copy and a shadow. It, it's The word shadow means shade or shadow. And so God was saying that the Old Testament tabernacle of Moses was to be built, built according to a very specific plan. However, 
uh, or because each part of the tabernacle did represent something about the tabernacle in heaven. However, it was not an exact copy. It was simply a poor reflection or poor image of the true tabernacle or sanctuary in heaven. So what I want to look at the Old Testament tabernacle of Moses today, which was really the same as the future tabernacle of Solomon that he built the physical object. Uh, uh, they had it set up the same inside there, okay? And, and I want to help us to discover something about worship, especially as, re as it refers or reflects on a personal worship time. Because as I said, the tabernacle was not a time of corporate worship. Whenever they wanted corporate worship, they stood in another place outside the tabernacle. And when it's interesting, uh, Pastor, what somebody referred to uh, uh, um, the singers, that was Pastor Sandy talking about the singers at the front of the army. The Jewish um, culture was they had singers and worships, worshipers everywhere in the army, you know, every, everyday life. But interestingly enough, there was no worship and singing in the tabernacle of Moses. Okay. We're going to learn why in, in next week or two. So the... Um, yeah, both the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness and the tabernacle in Jerusalem, the tabernacle of Solomon, were set up in the same way. And they both provided a, ma a manner or a method or a way for the Israelites to reconnect in relationship with God. Okay, and that's why it's so important. And I think I have a, a, a picture there. Uh, um, it's not in your notes, uh, but it is online. Uh, you can see here's the entrance, okay, also called the gates. They would come in, they and there's, there was only one way into the tabernacle, okay, only one way, <laughs> if you understand, only one way into the tabernacle. And immediately they came into the brazen altar where there were sacrifices made, big, big altar here. And there were actually tables across here and here for all the sacrificial animals to be killed. Uh, they're not shown here. And then after that was the brazen uh, laver or the brazen basin. And then they came inside the, the, uh, ho uh, the um, tent of meeting or the holy place. Oh, here's, here's the actual tabernacle here. This is called the courtyard of the tabernacle, totally enclosed inside these cloth walls, okay? And there's a brazen altar. Then you come in, brazen laver, sorry. And inside, there were three things here. There was the table of showbread right there. And on the other side was the candelabra or the uh, lampstand of the presence. And then there here was the altar of incense. And then you go through this huge veil or curtain into the most holy place here where the Ark of the Covenant was, okay? So we're going to go through that right now. So first I want to talk about the courtyard. Um, and, and the courtyard, as I said, was completely surrounded by these cloth walls and there was all these frames that held up the, the walls, okay? So it was a sacred place. You couldn't just wander into the courtyard. You could only go in through the one entrance. Um, and, and the entranceway was called the gates, okay? The entranceway, uh, I'll go back here just say, so the entranceway into the courtyard were, was called the entrance or the gates into the courtyard. And the entrance allowed the, the individual to come into the courtyard of the tabernacle. And as I said, there was only one entrance into the tabernacle, which speaks to the fact there's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son, Jesus, right? And, but this whole entrance thing speaks to us about making the conscious choice to move into the presence of God. Not like, well, I'll worship God when I feel led, um, as someone once said, we, sometimes we need to get the lead out, don't we? Uh, it's not about being led. It's about making the choice to come into God's presence and worship him whether we feel like it or not. We don't f uh, feel our way into an action. We do our way into a feeling, right? Principle there. Um, and, and so we make the conscious choice to come into God's presence. And how do we do that? Well, the Bible says... Psalm 100, verse 4, we enter his gates, his entrance, how? With thanksgiving, and into his courts. What was, see, David was talking about that very thing, about the tabernacle of Moses, and he said, we'll enter his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. 
Okay, so if we want to move into God's presence, which was what the tabernacle was all about, it was not specifically a place of worship in one sense. It was a it was a a, a, a tool that God had given so the Israelites would come back into relationship with Him by getting rid of sin and all these other things, right? So if we want to move in the presence of God, we have to intentionally start with thanksgiving and praise, okay? For what he's done for us in our lives. God, thank you that you've done this. You've done that. You've saved me. You've healed me. You've redeemed me. You, you've changed my life. You, you, you've given me your life in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. That's all part of entering his courts with praise. And so we start our entrance into the presence of God with praise and worship. And that's a great thing to do when we start a devotional time, whenever it's morning or evening or whatever. Then we come to this thing called the brazen altar. And the brazen altar is, is basically the brass-covered altar. That's what's called brazen. It's brass-covered. It's actually a key, a key uh, wood, I think, and it's covered with brass, okay? And, and, and it was the place where sacrifices were made to God. And, and, but the sacrifices were for the purpose of building and restoring relationship with God. I'd always been under the impression that the sacrifices were all about just dealing with sin, right? It was always a commiserating downtime of just, oh, I'm so sinful and I just need to come in and offer some sacrifices. But most of the sacrifices had nothing to do with sin. They were actually just about ex celebrating relationship. And that's why I call the brazen altar the place of celebration of relationship. Because first you had the burnt offering, where, and the burnt offering, yeah, there was a general sacrifice for sin, basically saying, oh, I'm sure I've done something this last week, right? I'm sure I've done something this month that I, that I shouldn't have done, so I'm going to make a general sacrifice. But really, the more important expression of the burnt offering was an expression of devotion to God. Whether I believe I've sinned or not, I'm going to present a burnt offering just to show you, God, how much I love you. Okay, it was an expression of desire for relationship, and I want to come into relationship. I, I, I'm, I'm doing this sacrifice of burnt offering to show you, God, that I really desire relationship with you. Okay, and then we had the grain offerings, and the grain offerings, again, were not about sin at all. They were basically an offering of gratefulness, a voluntary expression of gratefulness to God for his goodness and his provision. So every time there was a, a harvest, people would take grain offerings and give them to God and say, thank you, God, that you're so good to me. It had nothing to do with sin, okay? But it was done on the brazen altar. Then came the peace offering, the third type of offering in the Old Testament, the peace offering. And the peace offering, again, had nothing to do uh, um, with sin. It was, again, an expression of relationship because the peace offering was an expression of, th the, there were three types of peace offerings. The thanksgiving offering, where we just say, thank you, God, for what you've done for my life. Our free will offering, like, man, I'm just so happy that I'm in relation with God. I want to present an offering. Or a, a, a wave offering, which, again, is another expression of thanksgiving. And in each case, what would happen is the, the, peop the person would present a meal, and if it was a meal that you wanted to build a relate or to affirm a relationship with another person, the two of you brought this meal to the brazen altar and you burnt part of it before the Lord and the other part you ate with each other. It was basically a fellowship meal, right? It was a relational meal that you ate with another person. Now, if it was just about celebrating your relationship with God, then, then God's part got put on the altar, right? And you ate your part and God's part got put on the altar. Okay. So again, the peace offering had nothing to do with sin. It had to do with um, a commitment to each other. If, if it was a person, I say, I, I'm committed to your prosperity. I'm going to eat a meal with you and then commit to help you and you help me. So it was a, a relational thing. Okay. And that's why it was also called a fellowship offering. The peace offering was also called a fellowship offering. Well, then there was this thing, the sin offering. Okay. There was a time, the sin offering. And the sin offering was to atone for un intentional sin. When you knew you'd done, some, done something that you hadn't meant to do, then you would come into the uh, 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 tabernacle of Moses and you would present uh, the sin offering. But the sin offering always had two elements. There was first the burnt offering for the unintentional sin, and then there was the peace offering for the restoration of the relationship. So it wasn't just the burnt offering where, oh, I'm a, such a sinner. I'm just, God, you should strike me dead, but please don't. Like, I'm just so bad. I'm, I'm not worthy. No, no, no. The, 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 the sin offering was twofold. It was, God, here, I didn't mean to sin, but I did. So here's my sin offering. But also, I want to share with you, God, 
my peace offering because I want to show you that I want to get back in relationship with you, okay? So it, really the guilt or the, the sin offering was an offering for the purification of the person so that they could again come into right relationship with God. And then there was the final offering, the guilt offering. And the guilt offering, also known as the trespass offering, was when you had done something wrong that didn't just affect your relationship with God, but you also caused harm to someone else. Maybe you broke something of theirs or, by mistake, hurt somebody, right? And so there had to be restoration made. So God said, okay, go and be restored. If you owe them money, and actually, interesting enough, the rest, the guilt offering, you had to give 20% more. So if you lost $100, you would have to give them 120 back. If you broke a cart, you would have to buy them a better cart, right? There was always that increase. It was a restoration offering, okay? Even though there wasn't uh, uh, inflation in those days, you still had to give 20% more back, okay? And so the guilt offering, also known as the trespass offering, was an expression of, of commitment to repay to the person. So you repay to the person, and then you go to the, uh, uh, um, to, to the tabernacle of Moses, and you present an offering to God, right, a sacrifice to God. Say, Lord, I want to, be, I want to really be clear, right? I don't want to have any debt outstanding to my neighbor, so I'm going to present a, 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 this trespass offering or guilt offering to God also, okay? And so it was basically an offering that was made to commit to restore a relationship, okay? So the common element here is not sin. There was the sin offering, and, uh, but the, the common element here is not sin. It's about relationship, relationship with God and relationship with other people because how can you love God whom you have not seen if you don't love your neighbor who you have seen, the Bible says, right? So the whole thing about the, the brazen altar was not so much about sin. Now, we, we think of it as sin because you think about it for a minute. From sunrise to sunset, there were just animals being sacrificed because you had, what, three, four million Israelites there. Even if only 10% of them sinned, that's still 300,000 people that now owed a sacrifice. So there was blood everywhere, and it was very prevalent. And also, just the sound of all those animals being sacrificed really added to the fact, man, yeah, we are a sinful people, and we really do rely on the grace of God and the mercy of God, okay? But as I said, the whole thing about the, the, the brazen altar was not so much about the sin, but about a desire for rela- showing a desire for relationship, showing gratefulness for relationship, showing an expression of relationship, showing purification of relationship, and, and showing restoration of relationship. And that's what the brazen altar was really all about. And that's why um, the prophet Samuel said this, 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams, which is another expression of sacrifice. And so God was saying through, through the prophet Samuel, You missed it if you just think this is about sacrifice. This is not just about sacrifice. This is about obeying me, being in relationship with me and obeying me, and as a result uh, of obeying me, you're loving your neighbor, okay? Uh, Because the the great commandment was found uh, even in the Old Testament about loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And so God is saying, do what I say, because that's a lot more important than the sacrifice you're making today. And so for us today in our devotional time, the brazen altar is, is really a challenge for purity, yes. It's a, it's a, a challenge for purity before the Lord, uh, which means as we sit in God's presence, yes, it's okay to say, Lord, is there anything I need to get right with you? Is there anything I've done? Uh, you know, but, but as soon as God reveals it, then immediately you deal with it, right? Deal with that sin, repent of that sin, and, but then allow God to cleanse you, to purify you. Why? Because the purpose of that time is relationship, getting back into right relationship with God. Uh, you were, we were never called in our devotional times to commiserate in our sin, to convince ourselves how terrible we are, 
to, 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 to convince God that we're so unworthy, he really should strike us dead or something. That was never the purpose of that part of our devotional time. It was to quickly allow God to reveal the, the failure so that we could deal with it, ask him to purify us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to, pure, to forgive us and to purify us so we could back in right relationship with God, okay? Okay, so that's in the courtyard. Now we're going to move into the next section. Okay, can I go back here quickly? Probably not smart. Anyway, okay. so that was all done here in, the, in this part of the courtyard, but now we got to go to this little thing here. What's that? That's called the brazen laver or laver. There it is. Okay, and, and the, um, the brazen laver, um, it stood right between the brazen altar and the entrance into the holy place, okay, in, into the tent of meeting. And it was like a wash basin, basin or a, um, um, it was also brass, brass covered, so it's called brazen, so it's brass covered. And it was like a wash bowl or a basin that the priests would use to wash their hands in and, and, and feed in before they, they entered into the holy place. So it was after the altar, but before the holy place, okay? And it was made out of polished brass. Interesting enough, it was made out of high, they got these women, and they just polished and polished and polished and polished this brass until it became like mirrors. Why? So that when they came to the brazen altar, they could see their reflection in the brass of the, of the laver and see if they still had any uh, dirt on them or any impurities or anything like that on their feet because it was actually a, a, a pedestal and, and uh, up into this big wash basin, right? And so they could see themselves and see if there was any part of their lives that they weren't clean because they were ready to enter into the most holy place. And it's interesting, James talked about this. I think James was actually referring to the Old Testament when he said this. James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror or in, you know, in the brazen laver. And after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Like, was there any stain left there? Was there any smudge in my face? Oh, forgot. Like, okay. And, and, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law, into the mirror, into the word of God uh, that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. Okay? So basically, the brazen laver was this place of purification where we now had a one last chance to really not, not commiserate on our sin. As I said, we already dealt with our sin at the, at the uh, uh, um, burnt, uh, the um, brazen altar. Uh, we already dealt with our sin, but now it's just to make sure we're, we're purified, we're cleansed. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive and to purify. So the brazen laver is like that place where we're just letting the word of God wash over us and purify us. And again, we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. So the brazen altar is just a challenge for us to really let God, to, to put the parking brake on in our lives for a minute and let God wash over us. Let him use his word to wash over us and really cleanse us, okay, purify us. Anything he's revealed in our lives, we just say, Lord, yes, that's right. Please purify from me. Because it's, it, why do you want to sin and get forgiveness and sin and forget forgiveness and then sin and get forgiveness and sin? Why not sin and get forgiveness and then get purified so you don't sin again, right? That's why the brazen labor was so important. It, had, it gave you a chance to actually get purified and cleansed, okay? Okay, so now we're going to move into the next place. After the courtyard, we're going to move into the, the holy place, also known as the tent of meeting, okay? So there, the priests are proper. Now, again, remember, it's a place of individual approaching God, okay? It was not a corporate worship time, and that's why the next session, section after all this stuff about restored relationship only the the priests could go into the next area okay into the holy place the tent of meeting and, and and in the whole in that place there was three things okay there were three things number one there was a table of showbread at the right hand side if you, as you're working towards the the ark of the covenant on the right hand side in the in the holy place was the uh, table of showbread and it was also called the bread of the presence interest, right? Because the whole tabernacle is about relationship, 
Okay, so the, br the, the, the table of showbread, it says here, Exodus chapter 25, verse 30, and you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me regularly, actually weekly, every first day of the week it was replaced, okay? And, and so basically there was these, this table of 12 loaves of bread, um, each one representing a tribe of Israel, and they were placed in two rows of six, okay, on the table, and they were replaced every Sabbath with two with, with 12 more loaves of bread because the word of God is never stale, is it? Or it shouldn't be stale to us, okay? And so, but, but also the bread emphasized God's provision for Israel, right? As their source of life. God promises to give us bread to nurture us, to, to, to nourish us, sorry. So the bread emphasized God's provision, but it also emphasized the intimate fellowship between God and his people because when you, uh, ate together a as believers, you break bread, right? So the bread was emphasizing the relationship that God wanted to have with his people, okay? It's an expression of fellowship. And, and, and as such for us today, the table of showbread, as we go through our devotional time, the table of showbread represents our intimate fellowship with God, okay? First John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, with him and us. There's fellowship going on. And then the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So, so there's an, uh, an ongoing purifying dynamic to fellowship with God. But the whole focus is on f the table of showbread was all about fellowship, okay? All about fellowship. Fel fellowshipping through his rhema word, through his logos word, through talking to him, okay? And so when we enter into God's presence in our private time, we should spend some time just sitting there talking to the Lord. Okay? If all we do is read the word and then run away, we totally miss the purpose of what God, the meeting of God, right? And that's why the tabernacle was a process of different things. Okay, so we come into God's presence. We have a time of fellowship with him, talking to him and listening to him. Now then, also in the holy place, on the right, on the left-hand side, there was this thing called the golden lampstand, okay? The golden lampstand. And, and it was like a two-dimensional um, uh, tree. It looked like a two-dimensional tree, right? There and there was a, 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 um, a base and a center shaft, and then th um, three branches on the left, three branches on the right, and then a center branch. So there was seven in total. And on the end of every branch was a, a carved almond flower. And each flower contained a, a, a oil, a little uh, um, a lamp of oil, okay? And, and, and why the almond tree? Because the almond tree uh, was the first tree to blossom every spring in Israel, okay? And so it speaks about bearing fruit, it speaks about, about first fruits, okay? Um, and, that, and Jesus, uh, it, it, when he was crucified in the spring, he's our first fruits, but that's another story we'll talk about later, okay? And, and the, the light in the lampstand uh, was the only source of light, get this, the light of the lampstand was the only source of light in the holy place. And it, it was never allowed to go out at all, okay? And for us today, the golden lampstand speaks about the illumination that comes through Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts uh, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Okay? And, and God's light in us is not to ever go out. Right? It's, the sor it's our, to be our source of light. Okay, his presence in our lives is to be our source of light. And so after we've had a time of fellowship with the Lord in the holy place, we should ask God to give us illumination, uh, illumination on the issues of our life, illumination, you know, search me, O God, see if there, is there any way in me that needs to be dealt with? Are, am I doing the right things? God, just illuminate the, all the issues in my life. I don't want any blind spots. Thank you, God, that light will shine in that place of darkness in our hearts, right? He'll, he'll, his light will shine in our hearts and give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Okay, so that's the time where God's gonna, we're gonna invite God to deal with our blind spots and show us those things that need to be dealt with in our lives. Not so much sin, but maybe there are other things that we need to tweak in our lives, right? We need to adjust in our lives that are just not pleasing to God. 
okay? But then as we go through the, 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 the altar uh, uh, or the, the table of showbread and then the golden lampstand, there was the third item in the holy place, and that was the altar of incense, okay? Now, a lot of commentators will say, well, you know, incense can mean worship or prayer, but the interesting thing, when you actually check the Bible, prayer or incense always means prayer, always means prayer. It never talks about worship. It's always talking about prayer, okay? And, and so there was um, right in front of that veil that would go into the most holy place, right in front of that veil was this altar of incense. And the incense um, um, was burned on the altar after twilight of every morning, just as the, or just, as the sun was coming up in the morning, they would go and they would put incense into the, uh, light the incense in the, on the altar of incense. A and the fire that was to be used to burn the incense had to, had to come from the, the, the brazen altar outside. They would have to take some of the fire of the restored relationship, the fire of cleansing and restored relationship, now had to come in and light the incense. Again, speaking of the, that we can offer incense to the Lord because we have right relationship, right? Okay, so the, and the, the Lord said that the altar of incense, call it, or he said, this is most holy to the Lord, most holy. Because, in, because after we have come into relationship, then he's super pleased with our prayers unto him, Okay. So in scripture, incense is always associated with prayer. Um, Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So the prayer was the morning sacrifice. It was basically praying to God and especially for intercessory prayer, okay? It speaks of our prayer, our general prayers, but especially our intercessory prayers uh, because uh, God wants us to be, be concerned for our neighbor also, right? So we intercede to the Lord. But after we've had that time of fellowship with the Lord and he's revealed anything in our lives we need to deal with, and we've had that time uh, of uh, revelation from the Lord, okay, where he's uh, giving us illumination on the things in our life, now we can go, yeah, the fellowship and the illumination, now we can go to that place where we can now pray for others. And then we go to that third place, the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was inside the Tent of Meeting, but it was a separate compartment at the front of the Tent of Meeting, okay? And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year, okay? And the high priest was the one who was chosen by God. Not anybody could go in. It had to be the one chosen by God who would go through a number of, number of purification rites. They had to put on clean linen garments, okay, the garments that God specifically declared they had to wear, the linen, the pure linen garments, and then they could, he, they could go into the Holy of Holies and stand in the presence of God. Um, Levitic, where are we here? Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place uh, inside the veil because, or before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that, they, uh, so that he may not die. Like, you don't come when you want. Okay, this is a, you had to be invited from the lo by the Lord at a certain point in time every year, and you had to be wearing the right garments of righteousness, right? Uh, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. And I don't have a picture that shows the ark with the, with the golden ark, with the cover, with the two cherub. Um, and, and, and then God's presence would appear above the, the mercy seat in a cloud between the cherub, okay? Uh, but let's talk about the Holy of Holies. First, there was that veil. There was the sin barrier. Thank God that today the sin barrier has been removed. But there was this barrier because of our sin that kept people from going into God's very presence, okay? And so only once a year, see, see the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the veil still. So this veil blocked entrance into the most, or into the most holy place, and it was made up of fine linen, um, but also blue and purple and scarlet, uh, yarn that had been woven together, and in it was embroidered little cherub, okay? Speaking of heaven, you were about to enter into the place of God's presence. So the cherub represented the fact that they were entering into this heavenly realm, okay? 
And, and uh, as such, the barrier represents our, our, our sin, right? Uh, which apart from the Savior, we could not, apart from a Savior, we cannot enter into God's presence. And so really our personal worship time should in include just a time of saying, thank you, God, I can come boldly before the throne of grace. Thank you, God, I can actually come into your manifest presence, your place of mercy. Thank you, God, because Jesus has removed the veil, the barrier, I can come and receive mercy from you in my time of need. So we now have access into the very presence of God. I'm going to explain that again more next week. So there was the veil, but then there was also the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's manifest presence. It was a symbol of, of Israel's special relationship with God. No, no foreigner could enter into that place. It had to be someone chosen of God, of the chosen race, of God's special people. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement, which is also called Yom Kippur, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and, and to, to burn incense and to... Um, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, okay, to sprinkle the blood of a sacrificial animal on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant so that there could be the mercy of God because no person had the right to stand in God's presence without being struck dead, but because of the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat, there was mercy coming from God towards the person, okay? And so, also, as he sprinkled the blood, he was atoning for his own sins, but he was also atoning for the sins of the people. This was the corporate expression of the tabernacle of Moses, where, where the, the priest would come once a year and atone for the sins of everyone together. The rest of the time, it was only individuals that were going through the uh, um, tabernacle of Moses. And inside the tabernacle of Moses was the ark of the uh, covenant. And the, the interesting, there was three things in the ark of the covenant. Okay, there was the Ten Commandments, which uh, spoke, they certainly was the law, but it also spoke about God's covenant with Israel, right? The commandments was a covenant that God made specifically with Israel. And God even said later in Deuteronomy or Moses, through Moses that the covenant, the, the Ten Commandments were to impress all the other nations when they said, look what an incredible righteous God those guys have because God has even given them righteous, righteous standards to live by. The Ten Commandments was always to speak of the righteousness of the people of God, okay, and, this, and to represent their covenant, okay. Then there was manna in this pot of gold, and the manna was actually manna that was left over from the days they traveled and uh, wandered in the wilderness, and they represented God's provision for Israel. God provided uh, all the time they were wandering the desert, right? Remember it says the quail came down, the manna came down, their clothes did not wear out, their shoes did not wear out. It was all about God's provision. And then there was Aaron's rod. Remember Aaron's rod that uh, at one time uh, the people were trying to uh, uh, re uh, say, how, how come Aaron gets to be the boss? Or how, how come we're, we're, not, we're as good as Aaron? And God said, tell you what, heads of the tribes, you come here with your rods, and uh, Aaron, you bring your rod, and we'll get to see who, who's going to be the leader here, who was the right before God to be the leader. And they came with the, the, the rods down, and the next morning Aaron's rod had budded. It had come alive, and it had budded. And they took that rod representing God's authority over Israel through Aaron, and they put that in the ark also, okay? So the three things in the ark represented God's covenant with Israel, God's provision for Israel, and God's authority over Israel, okay? And now we go, what, so above the, the ark was called the mercy seat. It was kind of the lid of the ark, but it was called the mercy seat, and, and um, it was there that God chose to reveal himself, okay? A and to dispense mercy. Remember that. The, the whole purpose of coming into God's presence was so that we can receive mercy and come into a deeper relationship with him, okay? Um, and also, mercy, and, and actually the mercy seat, in, in a sense, also put a lid on the Ten Commandments because <laughs> basically the mercy seat was protecting God's people from the ever-condemning judgment of the law, right? So the law was put inside the Ark of the Covenant representing the covenant, but also the Ten Commandments, but the mercy seat was on top. And so, thank God, we have mercy from the obligations of, 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 the, of, the, of the law of the Old Testament, Okay. And so when we enter into, um, in our time of devotional time with the Lord, um, the veil represents the fact that we're completely unworthy to 
enter God's presence, but thank God because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we can enter God's presence, okay? And experience not the condemnation of the law, but the mercy of God. And, and, and there, above the mercy seat, was the manifest presence of God. The cloud would actually come down visibly, and you could see the manifest presence of God in that place and have this encounter with God. The, 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 the high priest had an encounter with God. Well, thank God we have that availability 24 hours a day now to have a, an encounter with the manifest presence of God because the veil's been removed, and the mercy seat is there for us in the spirit. Okay. So, summary. Oh, and there's the mercy seat. Actually, yeah, let's look at that first. Hebrews chapter 4, 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, right? The, the throne of grace is really the mercy seat, with confidence so that we may receive mercy, right, and find grace, God's empowerment, to help us in our time of need. Okay. So again, that's all speaking of the mercy seat where we now can come into, because of the mercy seat, we can come to the Lord and experience his mercy and his grace. Okay, So, summary. We can look at the um, Old Testament tabernacle of Moses. As I said, I'll say it again, just to make it really clear. The tabernacle of Moses was not a true worship experience in one sense, okay? Because there was no... Um, it, it was not about experiencing the fullness of worship and praise. There was actually no music ever in the tabernacle of Mu Moses. There was no musical instruments at all. The tabernacle of Moses was to take a people who God was trying to refine and bring them to be a people that could come into righteous relationship with him. And, and so to me, that's a great thing to do every day during your devotional time is to reestablish relationship and make sure you have this pure unblock relationship with God. And it was always done by individuals, never by a core. It was not a corporate worship experience. That was never done in the tabernacle of Moses. It was an individual, if you want to call it an individual worship experience, where people came individually into the tabernacle of Moses to deal with the relationship with, with God and with others. Okay, But I did want to start with this today. So we look quickly. We have the courtyard, and inside the courtyard, uh, we have a time of thanksgiving and praise in our devotional time, a, t a celebration of relationship, dealing with if we got any sin, yes, confessing it, letting God deal with it, uh, pure, the brazen altar being purified from our sin, uh, just making sure that we're I o doing okay with God. See, that's the whole, that's the whole uh, foolishness. Yeah, I'll say it this way. Because uh, certain churches, what they do is they turn Sunday services into a repentance service. And, and I really get bothered by that. Uh, number one, because why did you just wait six and a half days to repent? Like, why don't you just deal with it now? If you sin on Monday, repent on Monday, right? Get purified on Monday. Don't wait till Sunday. Because by the time Sunday's come, that little stain is now a big stain, right? That little sin is now a big sin. The little offense is now a big off offense, right? So Sunday was never meant to be a service of repentance, Okay, it was Sundays to be a service of celebration. Okay, so, but in our private devotional time, daily, let's deal with those little things where they're still little. Okay, so praise and thanksgiving, celebration of our relationship with God, purification. Then we go into the holy place, a tent of meeting, where we have fellowship with God. We have a time of letting him illuminate revelation to our lives and, and issues in our hearts and a time of praying for ourselves and other people. Okay. And then we go into the Holy of Holies and thank God the sin barrier has been removed so that we can encounter God's mercy and grace uh, in, our, in, in the presence of God. Okay. Um, so there is a picture entering, dealing with at the brazen altar sacrifices, yes, confessing, and, and but coming back into right relationship, then receiving forgiveness and cleansing, entering into the whole, the most, the most, holy place where we have this really a worship experience of fellowshipping with him, uh, receiving illumination from him, and, and praying, and then entering into this place of divine encounter with God. Okay. It, it's, and it, if you download the notes off the website, you'll be able to get those two pictures, okay? 
uh, that the previous one. Um, so I just, I gave you that as a first understanding of worship, what we need to see is that God's intention of the Old Testament tabernacle, whether it be the tabernacle of Moses or the tabernacle of Solomon, which was now the kind of the, the big built thing, the solid thing in Jerusalem, they, they, they were not, they were never built as an expression, or as a place of worship. You need to get this. They were never to be an expression of worship in, in terms of the full sense of worship. They were to be uh, worship in the sense of a place where people could come and come back into right relationship with God and deal with issues so that there was that restored relationship with God and other people. And I think that's so important that we honor the true intent. Uh, we're going to look probably in week three at the tabernacle uh, of David, which was a whole different place. And that's where the praise and worship went, you know, the dance and the music instruments. That was the tabernacle of David. Uh, but we'll look at that, I think, week three or four. Okay. But this is a great model for devotion every day or three times a week or whatever you do where you just go through this process of staying in a right relationship with God, okay? So what I want to do, yeah, let's do that. Let's just close our eyes for a minute. Um, you know, thank God you've given us a pattern, right? Build according to the pattern. For the pattern for what? The pattern for restoring relationship. This is a great pattern for restoring right relationship with God. Just close your eyes, and just pick yourself coming to the entrance, the gates. And we just say, thank you, Father. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that there's an access into your presence. We thank you that Jesus has made that access. And so we thank you for the goodness that you've given us in our lives. And, and we, thank, we praise you for the wonderful things you've done for us. And Lord, we come inside the courtyard and, and we, we come to that brazen altar and we just celebrate the fact that even right now, if you're watching online or here, we can right now just quickly deal with that issue because the blood of Jesus has already cleansed us. So we can just come into that, ex receive the effectiveness of his blood right now to forgive us and to cleanse us. And come back, we just come back into right relationship with you. And we, we offer our free will uh, 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 offerings to you and say, thank you, God, for what you've done for us. Yeah, and if we do need, need to make restoration with another person, we do commit to do that. Lord, if we need to uh, re return something or, or, or replace something for a brother or sister, we're going to do that. But Lord, thank you. It's all about relationship with you. And we thank you that because of your brazen altar, we can have that restored relationship and commit to that restored relationship. And then, Lord, we stand before in your brazen labor, and we just say, Lord, we confess our sins. You said if we confess our sins, we receive forgiveness and cleansing. Lord, cleanse us. Cleanse us. If we're at home, we might need 10 minutes to do this, but right now we just say, Lord, cleanse us, purify us. Purify us afresh in Jesus' name. And Lord, we come into the holy place and we just have fellowship with you. Lord, we say that we love you. We say that we're so pleased that we made the choice to follow you. And we thank you that, that we can hear your voice. You said, you said your sheep hear your voice. So we can hear your voice. We can receive words, pictures, scriptures, uh, um, impressions from you. Thank you, Lord, that we can have a time of fellowship with you and then receive illumination on those things that uh, you want to show us in our lives, things that need to be uh, uh, readjusted, things that need to be uh, removed, things that need to be added. Thank you that you bring us illumination. And then we stand before the uh, altar of incense and we say, Lord, we pray for our Brothers and sisters, God, you encourage them, restore them, strengthen them, heal them. We pray for our, our natural families, God, that you would bring us back into right relationship, that you would um, uh, 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 bring healing to any brokenness, bring healing to any broken relationships, God. We pray for our governments, God, you would bring righteous governments and change the lives of the people that you put in place over us, Lord. Bless them but also heal them and, and, and meet with them, God. And we pray for international missions for Haiti that we support. 
and for Philippines and, and Pakistan now in India and, and, and Belize where we have uh, Eddie and Renata, um, Joseph also, Lord God. We just pray for them, God, that you would bless them, you would provide for their needs. Yes, God. And then we thank God there's no veil. <laughs> thank you, God, there's no veil. So we just walk right into your presence. We just walk into your presence. And we receive grace and mercy for finances. We see grace and mercy for uh, um, um, our family. Grace and mercy for our health. Grace and mercy for uh, um, whatever, our marriages, our families, God. And we can have an encounter with you and you can change us and transform us. Yes, Lord. Lord, help us to do that on a regular basis. Take the needed time and do that on a regular basis and experience the purpose, the real purpose of the tabernacle of Moses. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.